Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 552 of Jackets and Netting. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. It is early. And I'm impressed that my voice is working at all. This is great. So, I have so many things for you today. First, and most importantly, thank you, Cecilia, for writing back to me about netting. N-E-T-T-I-N-G. Here's what Cecilia has to share with us. Has anyone told you more about netting? I am familiar with the term and have a netted tablecloth that was my grandmother's. I don't think she made it, but I have no idea who did. I also have a copy of Weldon's Practical Needlework, and I'm knocking myself on the head that I didn't think of digging out my Weldon's while I was trying to figure this out myself. So thank you, Cecilia, for for having your brain plugged in when mine was not. She goes on to say, Weldon's has several patterns for various netting projects. My favorite is a potted meat frill. Yes, folks, you heard that right. P-O-T-T-E-D, M as in Mary, E-A-T, frill, F-R-I-L-L. I am now going to have to go dig out my Weldon's to see what this looks like. Then Cecilia says, most of these projects are smaller items, purses, doilies, a watch pocket, a baby's bonnet, a lady's scarf, a fichu, etc. But there is one for a shoulder cape. All of them are lacy. Some are more filled in than others. My tablecloth has areas that seem to be filled in and look woven, and other areas that are more open. Though I have tried to understand it by looking at my tablecloth and at the Weldon's book, I can't figure it out. It does seem to consist of tying knots at regular intervals, by tying them around a bar or wood or piece of ivory called a mesh, which is very confusing, then slipping that bar out. This keeps all the squares in the net even in size. The meshes come in different widths so that you could change the size of the holes. Calling, and Cecilia also says, calling the wooden piece a mesh seems very confusing to me. (laughs) I feel certain that the cloak Austin refers to must be something like the cape in her book. And she has attached several pictures for us, including two of her tablecloth. She goes on to say, I found this site and it's janeaustin.co.uk. And on the blog, there is an Aunt Ellen's Netting Instructions, which describes netting by using directions from A. Beaton's Book of Needlework. It sounds incredibly complicated. Maybe somebody else will know more about it than I do. So I went, of course, because rabbit holes, I went and followed Cecilia's linked on the Jane Austen site, which is also in the show notes for today. Here's where Cecilia and I agree. Wow, does the Beaton's Book of Needlework make it sound complicated? Holy cow. The thing that I found interesting, though, was that by going into Cecilia's pictures from her her own tablecloth, I was able to zoom in really, really close, and I've included this photograph as well, because I, I went through and I made the, the background of the photograph kind of dim, more, more transparent, and I went through and put circles at each one of the knots that I could find, and it starts, part of it starts to make sense. It looks like what you start with is, in effect, very large knotted Aida cloth like you would use for cross-stitching, except instead of it being several millimeters of gap in between the individual threads of Aida cloth, you have, say, a centimeter or more of space in between each one of the threads in the net. And so the netting, because it's so spread out, there's such huge gaps there, those in Aida cloth, what would be woven threads, they can't just be woven. They would completely fall apart. There would be no tension there to hold them together. So instead, each one of those threads at a point where they cross becomes a knot. It looks like what I remember doing with macrame. And maybe I did it this way because I was a kid. 
I don't know if it was actually in the instructions, but I, I do remember having put like a spacer bar or a spacer something. Maybe it was just one of my blocks from when I was a kid. I don't know, but I, I had something if it needed to be like, oh, no, I know how we did it. We had a pegboard. My mom had a, it'd be like the, the kind of board that we would use for blocking a, a shawl now where you could use the T-pins and measure down three inches and put a T-pin in, and then you would tie your knot up against that pin. <laughs> Which, okay, so now it all makes sense. Leanne, this is like the lace making with the pins, right? Into the pillows. Because the, the netting site at the janeaustin.co.uk link does talk about netting makers using heavily weighted pillows on tabletops, not in their lap. So this all starts to make sense because here's the final part of it. You have this very regular net that is like Aida cloth writ large and knotted at each point where a thread crosses another thread. It is not unlike a fisherman's net. And there are lots of websites out there that talk about how to make net like you would use to catch a fish or make a French market bag, perhaps, or something like that. It looks like what then happens is you take this, this field, this ground, this base of simple netted fabric that gives you squares, or if you let it kind of go off on its own, it'll look a little bit more like diamonds. And then you add the magic. And what it looks like is that the thread in Cecilia's tablecloth that is the forming the net is two ply. And it looks like the thread that is being used to make the design is a single ply. And you can see this best in the image that I transparencyed a little bit of. I have one differently colored circle. So all of these circles are blue and all of the blue circles are the little knots that I find that are very regularly spaced. The green circle is around what looks like a half hitch going around a, a corner right where one of the knots is. And that half hitch and the ensuing pattern that is woven Celtic knot-like in and out and among the regular mesh field background, that half hitch is quite definitely a single ply. And it is quite definitely connected to all of the other, like, twisty, churny, Celtic-y looking. Like if you try and follow one thread, you can see it's going over, under, over, under, around, but it's all very swirly compared to the over, under of the woven portion that you see on the left. The reason why I'm calling it a woven portion is because in between the regularly spaced knot work, there are regular over, under, over, under woven threads as well. Those are creating the, the filled-in portions that Cecilia was talking about, as opposed to kind of the lacy portions, which is where the single-ply Celtic-y stuff is happening. The other thing that I thought was interesting was once I looked at the link on the Mrs. Beaton's page, uh, which again is in the show notes for this episode, once I looked there, it was very clear that this is the kind of work that we've seen uh, certainly in movies, but also if we're lucky enough to have seen it in real life, the little velvet reticule bags often had lace work around the outside. I am now fairly convinced that that wasn't lace work like you would wear. That was probably this lacy netting that had been created because according to Beaton's, you can have flat netting and structured netting, and there are several different kinds. And it would all be determined on how you make that field, that background of simple knotted elements. So thank you, Cecilia, for doing the rabbit hole for me. That was great. And Cecilia is, in fact, who wrote to me before and whose email I lost. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for your patience and forbearance. And I hope you really liked New Hope when you were here before. Long, long time ago. It's changed quite a bit, I am sure. If you get a chance to come back, please do and let me know before you do. I also have three voicemails for you. So here we go with the voicemails from this last week. 
I'll catch you on the flip side. Hi, my name's Sumiko, and I um, have been just catching up on Northanger Abbey, and I have to say that the uh, Northanger Abbey movie that you've mentioned is one of my absolute favorites. I love the actor who plays Henry Tilney, and I just think that it just is a very lovely movie. Um, I'm also calling because I just recently sent you a bunch of links to carriage information, um, and I didn't want you to just see that on on uh, uh, Instagram with pictures. First, I found a picture of something that I thought, I mean, a gig is a two-wheeled cart, and there are two-wheeled carts today, so it's not like out of, uh, it's not that unusual. I think the difference between your average two-wheeled cart and a gig is that the two-wheel, the gig is like, lightweight and drawn by fast fast horse. And apparently the difference between a gig and a a curricle is that a curricle is for a team. And um, and then you have like a phaeton, which is four wheels. So um, one of the ones I think probably the most useful is there's a tour on the Carriage Association of America's page, which has pictures of different types of carriages. And then you click on them and you can see what they are. And it has a picture of what they call Stan, the Stanhope gig, and you can see what it is. But it's unfortunately it's not um, n- nobody's harnessed to it. You can't see it um, what it looks like with the horse horses attached the horse attached to it since it's a single thing. Anyway, I'm really enjoying Northanger Abbey, which I have always loved, just because it's the most for me the most outright comical of. Um, the main Jane Austen novels. I mean, I know that her juvenilia is extremely funny, and given how old she was when she started this, she must have just come out from writing some of those um, ridiculous <laughs> novels she wrote when she was young. Anyway, thank you so much. I really enjoy Craftlet, and I hope this information is useful. Hello, Heather. Kara Worcester. I had started listening to today's episode of Northanger Abbey, and you mentioned book binding. And I squealed, and I waited to see who you've been watching, and I was overjoyed to know that I know someone who does book binding that you haven't found yet. (laughs) Her name is C. Lemon, S-E-A-L-E-M-O-N. She is on YouTube, and I think everywhere, honestly. And she does all sorts of primarily paper crafting. Uh, she has DIYs for book binding. She does reviews of book binding equipment, including one that has a guide for piercing the holes for sewing segments together and doing the actual book binding. She has also been posting some chill videos where it's usually um, her editing art for her Spring shop and some with some chill lo fi hip hop or lo fi jazz music um, over everything. It's actually really nice. I've been consuming her stuff for probably about two years now and have been really enjoying that. Um, and I came across her thanks to uh, Makochin, uh, M A C C O D I N E. I think I'm not positive. Uh, she's also known as Mako. Uh, Again, on YouTube, I will link you to Makachin because I'm not positive on how to spell her name. I cannot remember, and I'm driving, and my brain is pudding. Uh, But she just put out a watercolor book that is actually very good for beginners or intermediates or anybody. Um, Her Art Journal Thursdays are very enjoyable as well. She'll walk you through an art journal prompt, and she'll do it with you on the screen. And it's actually very, very calming to listen to her speak in a uh, German accent. It's very, very good. Again, that's Sea Lemon and Makotin, M-A-C-C-O or Mako. I can't remember. <laughs> Pudding brain. I hope you're having a very calm Good Friday, Heather. I hope you have a very lovely Aspara, and I hope you are doing so very well and that you have more than two brain cells to tear paper, and splat gesso everywhere. (laughs) Talk to you soon. Hello, Heather. 
me again. I'm so sorry. Twice in one day. Oy, the day. I need to start listening to the episode and then calling. You were talking about the little unpure waisted jacket, like a bolero. That sounds a lot like a Spencer. Is it similar to that? And if anyone wants to see what a Spencer looks like, it's the uh, the jackets, the little jackets worn in Hamilton on the women. Um, if you want to see a Spencer being made by many a costumer on YouTube, Bernadette Banner has a video where she makes an all-black Spencer. Uh, and also, the pattern is being released in correlation with the entirety of the Broadway musical behind the scenes costume machine that is the Broadway costuming industry in New York in particular. There's this whole crazy coalition happening where the costuming companies are bond, uh, bonding together to try and make sure that the costume industry makes it through this crazy panini we're in so that we still have a Broadway theater community and actual Broadway productions after all of this craziness is over. Uh, again, that's Bernadette Banner making a Spencer following the Hamilton pattern. Uh, it's very good. She has a lot of information about fundraising that's happening behind the pattern sales for the Spencer. And there's talk of more patterns being released, maybe. I have to go watch it again and double check. But that's Bernadette Banner making the Hamilton Spencer. It sounds a lot like the tiny bolero jacket you're talking about. So thank you. Thank you for the information on, on the gigs. And and I'm so glad that you like Northanger. Tara. <laughs> I found I went of course I did I went and I found the YouTube links for Sea Lemon and I think it's Macachino I think she pronounces it Macachino it looks like it's spelled Macachino but it makes more sense if she's Mako that it's anyway I think it's Macachino because she makes stuff right both of these are clearly awesome YouTube channels to get lost in and I linked out specifically to a Sea Lemon how to make a cottage core journal out of homemade paper. She does a marvelous job of adding links out from her notes underneath her YouTube videos. YouTube video notes are harder and harder to find these days. Always look for like a little drop down arrow if you're viewing on a YouTube app. That'll drop the basically the show notes down below what your viewing window is. If you turn, if you're on a phone and you turn it portrait direction. On the website itself, it's usually easier to find the notes, but they, they never show you all of them. They show you like a teaser and then you have to click show more. I think it says show more these days. Anyway, Cottage Core, if you haven't discovered this, my 17-year-old has introduced me to this whole thing because you, you may have heard of things like Hardcore, C-O-R-E. Well, now there's Cottage Core. There are many cores. C-O-R-E's. Cottage Core is the one that Aiden thought he would be safe introducing me to. And this is, is basically the how to make yourself feel like you are living in the midst of an old-fashioned English country garden. So, so he knew that I would be attracted to that. It's beautiful. And her video for making the journal is, is easy and straightforward and, as Aiden would have predicted, very calming and pleasant to, to watch. So thank you, Tara, for giving me another rabbit hole. That's just great. And, and please, don't, please don't start finishing the episode before you call and leave a voicemail because it's just fun. <laughs> Your second voicemail on uh, Bernadette Banner and the Spencer jacket. Yes, I agree. It does sound like a, Spencerian, like a, like a Spencer jacket. For some reason, in the, one of the annotated copies that I've got, they make a big deal about it being called a jacinette and being something separate. I too cannot tell exactly the difference. I am horrified that I couldn't bring the word Spencer to mind last week when I recorded, but I'm not all that surprised. It had been a while. 
The Bernadette Banner video that Tara mentions is excellent and fascinating. And, and it is really lovely to get to see kind of behind the scenes of Broadway costume shops and find out uh, just how centralized the whole uh, industry actually is. It's really actually cool if you ever watched any of the Ham for Ham videos, H-A-M, and then the numeral four, and then H-A-M, which was a Hamilton ticket for a Hamilton bill, because Hamilton's on the $10 bill, the $10 founding father without a father. Uh Uh-huh. So Ham for Ham was the hashtag for a whole mess load of videos that the original Broadway cast was putting out, honestly, as a way to drive their public relations campaign. And it was genius. Several of the things became really clear while they were making those. And that was that they are friends with all of the other people in all of the other Broadway shows. And the people who work at one theater know the people who work at the theater next door. And they share, they share walls, they share space, they share streets, they share restaurants. And it's a big family thing, the whole Broadway gig, which is kind of lovely. And you really do get to see a a chunk of that in the Bernadette Banner video, along with learning a whole lot about uh, pattern making and uh, and specifically the the Spencer jackets. Bernadette Banner did another video earlier on Hamilton costumes, just in general, and talked very specifically about how well made they are and some of the the fancy schmancy bits that the costume designers put in that are absolutely historically accurate and that they really didn't need to do, but they're just that good. So that's also fun. Anything Bernadette Banner does, hoo-ha, just way great. So thanks you guys for sharing all of that with us. I super appreciate it. And now chapters 12 and 13. Here's what you need to know. You guys already know that the pump room had the book. And the book had the names of the people who were in town. And those pages that have the names on them would be dated. What we, I think I mentioned in passing, but I really didn't spend a whole lot of time on, was that you wouldn't just write down your name when you arrived in town. You would write down your name and your residence while in town. Nowadays, that seems kind of horrifying. But back then, there was no other way to find anyone, especially because Bath had this hugely transient population of people who were visiting as as tourists or as long-term tourists, the same way that if you were going to be renting a place at the beach in, say, the 50s, you could have your mail sent to you at the beach because you would be there, say, for a month. And so you would be in residence there. You might have even gone into the post office to let them know that you would be in residence at such and such house that you were hiring out for a month for the summer. These kinds of things happened back in the day. Some other uh, little archaicisms. I just made that word up, I think. I'm going to run with it. You will hear a doorman say that the lady of the house was walked out. She had walked out. She had gone for a walk. She had left. It was a turn of phrase using the was past tense. There's a whole long explanation for it. I'm not going to go into it. It's just she's already left is what he's getting around to saying. Henry Tilney, our lovely Henry Tilney, who we haven't seen for too long. Henry Tilney is normally referred to as either Henry by his sister or Mr. Tilney. Suddenly, in chapter 12 today, you will hear him referred to as Mr. Henry Tilney. This is not a different person. Jane Austen has not suddenly become extraordinarily formal, mid-book. Instead, it's that his father is present at that moment. And even though his father is General Tilney, there still needs to be a differentiation made because of age and rank and position and all of that stuff. So General Tilney is General Tilney. Mr. Henry Tilney is his son, Henry, who we know. You'll hear the word stout being applied to a gentleman. This is not a slight or a slanderous phrase. This is referring to him as being kind of hale and hearty and vigorous and strong. It is a compliment. It is not a negative being thrown about. 
The Bedford. The Bedford was a famous coffee house in London. And again, you know, anytime we talk about London, it's you go up to town. That would be going into London. You go down to wherever else you are going that isn't London. And London is when they talk about being in town, they're talking about being in London. But the Bedford was a very famous coffee house at the time, not a tea room. This is a coffee house, more male focused, although I do not believe that women were kept out of the Bedford at this time. But it was often frequented by writers and artists. So it was kind of famous. And you'll hear it, it referred to with great gusto. If you had a touch of a game, it was like you would play a round or part of a round. Uh, we're going to get Rich as a Jew again in this chapter. Guess who says it? Time's up. You were right. <laughs> He's just such a putz. You will hear a reference to being walked to her chair. This will be after having left the indoors of a place, and yet Catherine's being walked to her chair. That's her sedan chair. That's to go home in. If they were talking about being indoors, uh, it would be walking her to her seat. Chapter 13, we get to see the Royal Crescent. This is the very famous part of Bath, the homes that we talked about before. We get to go back to the Royal Crescent in Chapter 13 today. The normal pattern of going to call on someone to pay a visit, to pay a call, would be you go to their door, you knock on their door or ring their bell, should they have one. You wait. The doorman opens the door. You introduce yourself to the doorman. If you are coming to call and madam is not at home, you would leave your calling card with the doorman. And that way, when the lady of the house comes home, she would see all of the cards from all of the people who came to call while she was out. And then she would be able to pay visits back based on those cards. She'd be able to organize her day the next day by organizing the cards. It's actually really genius. I love that. But the, the big point here is that you would wait for the door to be opened. You would tell the doorman who you are, who you want to see, and then you would wait while the doorman goes inside to see if Madam is in. Madam has two choices at that point. Yes, I am in, show the lady to my drawing room, or no, I am not in. I am telling you right here from inside, I am not in. Please go tell her I am not in right now. You are still standing on the doorstep awaiting to be allowed entry. You do not push in with the doorman. Just saying. And certainly, once you are inside the house, you would have the doorman walk you to the, or the footman or the butler, whoever was going to do the guiding, would guide you to the room into which you were being invited, and they would open that door for you. I'm making a big deal about this because none of this is going to happen. So <laughs> now, now you know the should. Soon you will see the what happened was. The other piece of information to know about paying a visit is that the expected length of a first visit from, so the first time I come to visit you at your home, the expected length of my stay would be 15 minutes. At that 15 minute point, I would graciously thank you for uh, allowing me to come visit. I would rise to go. And then you, the hostess at that point, have two choices. You can rise and thank me for coming and call for the doorman, the footman to come and show me out. Or you could say, oh no, please don't go. If you, if you do have longer to stay, please do. And we can get on with having a good time talking about seeing lemon and macchiato. But 15 minutes at the 15 minute point, somebody who has been even just barely trained in how to pay a call would know that it is time to, to stand and, and make your gracious thank yous and start to leave. And I think that is everything I need to tell you before we listen. So now we have chapters 12 and 13 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Mia Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 12. Mrs. Allen, said Catherine the next morning, will there be any harm in my calling on Miss Tilney today? I shall not be easy till I have explained everything. Go by all means, my dear, only put on a white gown. Miss Tilney always wears white. 
Catherine cheerfully complied, and, being properly equipped, was more impatient than ever to be at the pump room, that she might inform herself of General Tilney's lodgings, for though she believed that they were in Milsom Street, she was not certain of the house, and Mrs Allen's wavering convictions only made it more doubtful. To Milsom Street she was directed, and having made herself perfect in the number, hastened away with eager steps and a beating heart to pay her visit, explain her conduct, and be forgiven. Tripping lightly through the churchyard, and resolutely turning away her eyes that she might not be obliged to see her beloved Isabella and her dear family, who she had reason to believe were in a shop hard by. She reached the house without any impediment, looked at the number, knocked at the door, and inquired for Miss Tilney. The man believed Miss Tilney to be at home, but was not quite certain. Would she be pleased to send up her name? She gave her card. In a few minutes the servant returned, and with a look which did not quite confirm his words, said he had been mistaken, for that Miss Tilney had walked out. Catherine, with a blush of mortification, left the house. She left almost persuaded that Miss Tilney was at home, and too much offended to admit her, and as she retired down the street could not withhold one glance at the drawing-room windows in expectation of seeing her there. But no one appeared at them. At the bottom of the street, however, she looked back again, and then, not at the window, but issuing from the door, she sought Miss Tilney herself. She was followed by a gentleman, who Catherine believed to be her father, and they turned up towards Edgar's buildings. Catherine, in deep mortification, proceeded on her way. She could almost be angry herself at such angry incivility, but she checked the resentful sensation. She remembered her own ignorance. She knew not how such an offence as hers may be classed by the laws of worldly politeness, to what degree of unforgiveness it might with propriety lead, nor to what rigours of rudeness, in return, it might justly make her amenable. Dejected and humbled, she had even some thoughts of not going with the others to the theatre that night. But it must be confessed that they were not of long continuance, for she soon recollected in the first place that she was without any excuse for staying at home, and in the second that it was a play she wanted very much to see. To the theatre accordingly they all went. No Tilneys appeared to plague or please her. She feared that amongst the many perfections of the family a fondness for plays was not to be ranked but perhaps it was because they were habituated to the finer performances of the London stage, which she knew, on Isabella's authority, rendered everything else of the kind quite horrid. She was not deceived in her own expectation of pleasure. The comedy so well suspended her care that no one observing her during the first four acts would have supposed she had any wretchedness about her. On the beginning of the fifth, however, the sudden view of Mr Henry Tilney and his father joining a party in the opposite box recalled her to anxiety and distress. The stage could no longer excite genuine merriment, no longer keep her whole attention. Every other look, upon an average, was directed towards the opposite box, and for the space of two entire scenes did she thus watch Henry Tilney without being once able to catch his eye. No longer could he be suspected of indifference for a play. His notice was never withdrawn from the stage during two whole scenes. At length, however, he did look towards her, and he bowed, but such a bow, no smile, no continued observance attended it. His eyes were immediately returned to their former direction. Catherine was restlessly miserable. She could almost have run round to the box in which he sat and forced him to hear her explanation. Feelings rather natural than heroic possessed her. Instead of considering her own dignity injured by this ready condemnation, Instead of proudly resolving in conscious innocence to show her resentment towards him who could harbour a doubt of it, to leave him all the trouble of seeking an explanation, and to enlighten him on the past only by avoiding his sight or flirting with somebody else, she took to herself all the shame of misconduct, or at least of its appearance, and was only eager for an opportunity of explaining its cause. The play concluded, the curtain fell, Henry Tilney was no longer to be seen where he had hitherto sat, but his father remained, and perhaps he might be now coming round to their box. She was right. In a few minutes he appeared, and making his way through the then thinning rows, spoke with a calm politeness to Mrs Allen and her friend. Not with such calmness was he answered by the latter. "'Oh, Mr Tilney, I've been quite wild to speak to you and make my apologies. 
You must have thought me so rude, but indeed it was not my own fault, was it, Mrs. Allen? Did they not tell me that Mr. Tilney and his sister were gone out in a phaeton together? And then what could I do? But I had ten thousand times rather have been with you. Now had I not, Mrs. Allen? My dear, you tumble my gown, was Mrs. Allen's reply. Her assurance, however, standing sole as it did, was not thrown away. It brought a more cordial, more natural smile to his countenance, and he replied in a tone which retained only a little affected reserve. "'We were much obliged to you, at any rate, for wishing us a pleasant walk after our passing you in Argyle Street. You were so kind to look back on purpose.' "'But indeed I did not wish you a pleasant walk. I never thought of such a thing, but I begged Mr. Thorpe so earnestly to stop. I called out to him as soon as ever I saw you. Now, Mrs. Allen, did I not?' "'Oh, you were not there, but indeed I did. "'And if Mr. Thorpe would only have stopped, "'I would have jumped out and run after you.' "'Is there a Henry in the world "'who could be insensible to such a declaration? "'Henry Tilney, at least, was not. "'With a yet sweeter smile, "'he said everything that needed to be said "'or his sister's concern, regret, "'and dependence on Catherine's honour. "'Oh, do not say Miss Tilney was not angry.' cried Catherine, because I know she was, for she would not see me this morning when I called. I saw her walk out of the house the next minute after me leaving it. I was hurt, but I was not affronted. Perhaps you did not know that I'd been there. I was not within at the time, but I heard of it from Eleanor, and she has been wishing ever since to see you, to explain the reason of such incivility, but perhaps I can do it just as well. It was nothing more than that my father... They were just preparing to walk out, and he, being hurried for time and not caring to have it put off, made a point of her being denied. That was all, I do assure you. She was very much vexed and meant to make her apology as soon as possible. Catherine's mind was greatly eased by this information, yet a something of solicitude remained, from which sprang the following question, thoroughly artless in itself, although rather distressing to the gentleman. But, Mr. Tilney, why were you less generous than your sister? she felt such confidence in my good intentions and could suppose it to be only a mistake, why should you be so ready to take offence? Me? I take offence? Nay, I'm sure by your look when you came into the box you were angry. I? Angry? I could have no right. Well, nobody would have thought you had no right who saw your face. He replied by asking her to make room for him and talking of the play. He remained with them some time and was only too agreeable for Catherine to be contented when he went away. Before they parted, however, it was agreed that the projected walk should be taken as soon as possible, and setting aside the misery of his quitting their box, she was upon the whole left one of the happiest creatures in the world. Whilst talking to each other, she had observed with some surprise that John Thorpe, who was never in the same part of the house for ten minutes together, was engaged in conversation with General Tilney she felt something more than surprise when she thought she could perceive herself the object of their attention and discourse. What could they have to say of her? She feared General Tilney did not like her appearance. She found it was implied in his preventing her admittance to his daughter, rather than postpone his own walk for a few minutes. How came Mr John Thorpe to know your father? was her anxious inquiry as she pointed them out to her companion. He knew nothing about it, but his father, like every military man, had a very large acquaintance. When the entertainment was over, Thorpe came to assist them in getting out. Catherine was the immediate object of his gallantry, and while they waited in the lobby for a chair, he prevented the inquiry which had travelled from her heart almost at the tip of her tongue by asking in a consequential manner whether she had seen him talking with General Tilney. "'He's a fine old fellow upon my soul. Stout, active, looks as young as his son.' I've a great regard for him, I assure you, a gentleman-like good sort of fellow has ever lived. But how came you to know him? Know him? There are a few people much about town that I do not know. I've met him forever at the Bedford, and I knew his face again today the moment he came into the billiard room. One of the best players we have, by the by. And we had a little touch together, though I was almost afraid of him at first. The odds were five to four against me, and if I had not made one of the cleanest strokes that perhaps ever was made in the world... I took his ball exactly, but I could not make you understand without a table. However, I did beat him. A very fine fellow, as rich as a Jew. I should like to dine with him. I dare say he gives famous dinners. But what do you think we've been talking of? You! Yes, by heavens! And the general thinks you the finest girl in Bath. How nonsense! How can you say so? And what do you think I said? Lowering his voice. Well done, general. 
said I, I'm quite of your mind. Here Catherine, who was much less gratified by his admiration than by General Tilney's, was not sorry to be called away by Mr. Allen. Thorpe, however, would see her to her chair, and till she entered it continued the same kind of delicate flattery, in spite of her entreating him to have done. That General Tilney, instead of disliking, should admire her was very delightful, and she joyfully thought that there was not one of the family whom she need now fear to meet. The evening had done more, much more for her, than could ever have been expected. Chapter 13 Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday have now passed in review before the reader. The events of each day, its hopes and fears, mortifications and pleasures, have been separately stated, and the pangs of Sunday only now remain to be described and close the week. The Clifton scheme had been deferred, not relinquished, and on the afternoon's crescent of this day it was brought forward again. In a private consultation between Isabella and James, the former of whom had particularly set her heart upon going, and the latter no less anxiously placed his upon pleasing her, it was agreed that providing the weather were fair, the party should take place on the following morning, and they were to set off very early in order to be home in good time. The affair thus determined, and thoughts approbation secured, Catherine only remained to be apprised of it. She had left them for a few minutes to speak to Miss Tilney. In that interval the plan was completed, and as soon as she came again her agreement was demanded. But instead of the gay acquiescence expected by Isabella, Catherine looked grave, was very sorry, but could not go. The engagement, which ought to have kept her from joining in the former attempt, would make it impossible for her to accompany them now. She had that moment settled with Miss Tilney to take their promised walk to-morrow. It was quite determined, and she would not, upon any account, retract. But that she must and should retract was instantly the eager cry of both the Thorpes. They must go to Clifton to-morrow. They would not go without her. It would be nothing to put off a mere walk for one day longer, and they would not hear of her refusal. Catherine was distressed, but not subdued. Do not urge me, Isabella. I am engaged to Miss Tilney. I cannot go. This availed nothing. The same arguments assailed her again. She must go. She should go. And they would not hear of a refusal. It would be so easy to tell Miss Tilney that you had just been reminded of a prior engagement and must only beg to put off the walk till Tuesday. No, it would not be easy. I could not do it. There has been no prior engagement. But Isabella became only more and more urgent, calling on her in the most affectionate manner, addressing her by the most endearing names. She was sure her dearest, sweetest Catherine would not seriously refuse such a trifling request to a friend who loved her so dearly. She knew her beloved Catherine to have so feeling a heart, so sweet a temper, to be easily persuaded by those she loved. But all in vain. Catherine felt herself to be in the right, and though pained by such a tender, such flattering supplication, could not allow it to influence her. Isabella then tried another method. She reproached her with having more affection for Miss Tilney, though she had known her so little a while, than for her best and oldest friends, with being grown cold and indifferent, in short, towards herself. I cannot help being jealous, Catherine, when I see myself slighted for strangers, I who loved you so excessively. When once my affections are placed, it is not in the power of anything to change them, but I believe my feelings are stronger than anybody's. I am sure they are too strong for my own peace, and to see myself supplanted in your friendship by strangers does cut me to the quick, I own. These tilneys seem to swallow up everything else. Catherine thought this reproach equally strange and unkind. Was it the part of a friend thus to expose her feelings to the notice of others? Isabella appeared to her ungenerous and selfish, regardless of everything but her own gratification. These painful ideas crossed her mind, though she said nothing. Isabella, in the meanwhile, had applied her handkerchief to her eyes, and Morland, miserable at such a sight, could not help saying, "'Nay, Catherine, I think you cannot stand out any longer now. The sacrifice is not much, and to oblige such a friend, I shall think you quite unkind if you still refuse.' This was the first time of her brother's openly siding against her, and anxious to avoid his displeasure, she proposed a compromise. 
if they would only put off their scheme till Tuesday, which they might easily do, as it depended only on themselves, she could go with them, and everybody might be satisfied. But no, 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 was the immediate answer. For that could not be, for Thorpe did not know that he might not be go to town on Tuesday. Catherine was sorry, but could do no more, and in short, silence ensued, which was broken by Isabella, who in a voice of cold resentment said, "'Very well, then. There is an end to the party. If Catherine does not go, I cannot. I cannot be the only woman. I would not upon any account in the world do so improper a thing.' "'Catherine, you must go,' said James. "'But why cannot Mr. Thorpe drive one of his other sisters? I dare say either of them would like to go.' "'Thank ye,' cried Thorpe. "'But I did not come to Bath to drive my sisters about and look like a fool. "'No, if you do not go, damn me if I do. "'I'd only go for the sake of driving you.' "'That is a compliment which gives me no pleasure.' "'But her words were lost on Thorpe, who had turned abruptly away. "'The three others still continued together, "'talking in a most uncomfortable manner to poor Catherine. "'Sometimes not a word was said. "'Sometimes she was again attacked with supplications or reproaches, "'and her arm was still linked within Isabella's though their hearts were at war. At one moment she was softened, at another irritated, always distressed but always steady. "'I did not think you had been so obstinate, Catherine,' said James. "'You were not used to being so hard to persuade. You were once the kindest, best-tempered of my sisters.' "'I hope I am not less so now,' she replied very feelingly. "'But indeed I cannot go. If I am wrong, I am doing what I believe to be right.' "'I suspect.' said Isabella in a low voice, there is no great struggle. Catherine's heart swelled. She drew away her arm, and Isabella made no opposition. Thus passed a long ten minutes, till they were again joined by Thorpe, who, coming to them with a gayer look, said, "'Well, I've settled the matter, and now we may all go tomorrow with a safe conscience. I've been to Miss Tilney and made your excuses.' "'You have not!' cried Catherine. I have upon my soul, left her this moment, told her you'd sent me to say that, having just recollected a prior engagement of going to Clifton with us tomorrow, you could not have the pleasure of walking with her till Tuesday. She said very well Tuesday was just as convenient to her, so there is an end of all our difficulties. A pretty good thought of mine, hey? Isabella's countenance was once more all smiles and good humour, and James too looked happy again. A most heavenly thought indeed! Now, my sweet Catherine, all our distresses are over. You are honourably acquitted, and we shall have the most delightful party. This will not do, said Catherine. I cannot submit to this. I must run after Miss Tilney directly to set her right. Isabella, however, caught hold of one hand, Thorpe of the other, and remonstrances poured in from all three. Even James was quite angry. When everything was settled, when Miss Tilney herself said that Tuesday would suit her as well, it was quite ridiculous, quite absurd to make her any further objection. "'I do not care. Mr Thorpe had no business to invent such a message. "'If I had thought it right to put it off, I could have spoken to Miss Tilney myself. "'This is only doing it in a ruder way. "'And how do I know that Mr Thorpe has? "'He may be mistaken again, perhaps. "'He led me into one act of rudeness by his mistake on Friday. "'Let me go, Mr Thorpe. Isabella, do not hold me.' "'Thorpe told her it would be in vain to go after the Tilneys. "'They were turning into the corner of Brook Street when he had overtaken them, "'I'm we're at home by this time.' "'Then I will go after them,' said Catherine. "'Wherever they are, I will go after them. "'It does not signify talking. "'If I could not be persuaded into doing what I thought was wrong, "'I will never be tricked into it.' "'And with these words, she broke away and hurried off. "'Thorpe would have darted after her, but Morland withheld him. "'Let her go, let her go, if she will. "'She is as obstinate as—' "'Morland never finished the simile, for it could hardly have been a proper one.' Away walked Catherine in great agitation, as fast as the crowd would permit her, fearful of being pursued, yet determined to persevere. As she walked, she reflected on what had passed. It was painful for her to disappoint and displease them, particularly to displease her brother, but she could not repent her resistance. Setting her own inclination apart, to have failed a second time in her engagement to Miss Tilney, to have retracted a promise voluntarily made only five minutes before, and on false pretence too, must have been wrong. She had not been withstanding them on selfish principles alone. She had not consulted merely her own gratification. That might have been insured, in some degree, by the excursion itself, by seeing Blaise Castle. 
No, she had attended to what was due to others and to her own character in their opinion. Her conviction of being right, however, was not enough to restore her composure. Till she had spoken to Miss Tilney, she could not be at ease, and quickening her pace when she got clear of the crescent, she almost ran over the remaining ground till she gained the top of Milson Street. So rapid had been her movements that in spite of the Tilney's advantage at the outset, they were but just turning into their lodgings as she came within view of them. And the servant still remaining at the open door, she used only the ceremony of saying that she must speak with Miss Tilney at that moment, and hurrying by him proceeded upstairs. Then, opening the first door before her, which happened to be the right, she immediately found herself in the drawing-room, with General Tilney, his son and daughter. Her explanation, defective only in being, from her irritation of nerves and shortness of breath, no explanation at all, was instantly given. "'I am come in a great hurry. It was all a mistake. I never promised to go. I told them from the first I could not go. I ran away in a great hurry to explain it. I did not care what you thought of me. I would not stay for the servant.' The business, however, though not perfectly elucidated by this speech, soon ceased to be a puzzle. Catherine found that John Thorpe had given the message, and Miss Tilney had no scruples in owning herself greatly surprised by it. But whether her brother had still exceeded her in resentment, Catherine, though she instinctively addressed herself as much to one as the other in her vindication, had no means of knowing. Whatever might have been felt before her arrival, her eager declarations immediately made every look and sentence as friendly as she could desire. The affair thus happily settled, she was introduced by Miss Tilney to her father, and received by him with such ready, such solicitous politeness, as recalled Thorpe's information to her mind, and made her think with pleasure that he might be sometimes depended on. To such anxious attention was the general civility carried, that, not aware of her extraordinary swiftness in entering the house, he was quite angry with the servant whose neglect had reduced her to open the door of the apartment herself. What did William mean by it? He should make a point of inquiring into the matter. And if Catherine had not most warmly asserted his innocence, it seemed likely that William would lose the favour of his master for ever, if not his place, by her rapidity. After sitting with them a quarter of an hour, she rose to take leave, and then was most agreeably surprised by General Tilney's asking her if she would do his daughter the honour of dining and spending the rest of the day with her. Miss Tilney added her own wishes. Catherine was greatly obliged, but it was quite out of her power. Mr. and Mrs. Allen would expect her back every moment. The general declared that he could say no more. The claims of Mr. and Mrs. Allen were not to be superseded, but on some other day, he trusted, when longer notice could be given, they would not refuse to spare her to her friend. Oh, no, Catherine was sure they would not have the least objection. She should have great pleasure in coming. The general attended her himself to the street door, saying everything gallant as they went down the stairs, admiring the elasticity of her walk, which corresponded exactly with the spirit of her dancing, and making her one of the most graceful bows she had ever beheld when they parted. Catherine, delighted by all that had passed, proceeded gaily to Pulteney Street, walking as she concluded with great elasticity, though she had never thought of it before. She reached home without seeing anything more of the offended party, and now that she had been triumphant throughout, had carried her point, and was secure of her walk, she began, as the flutter of her spirit subsided, to doubt whether she had been perfectly right. A sacrifice was always noble, and if she had given away to their entreaties, she should have been spared the distressing idea of a friend displeased, a brother angry, and a scheme of great happiness to both destroyed, perhaps through her means. To ease her mind, and ascertain by the opinions of an unprejudiced person that her own conduct had really been, she took occasion to mention it before Mr. Allen, the half-settled scheme of her brother, and the Thorpes for the following day. Mr. Allen caught at it directly. Well, said he, and do you think of going too? No, I had just engaged myself to walk with Miss Tilney before they told me of it, and therefore, you know, I could not go with them, could I? No, certainly not, and I'm glad you do not think of it. Those schemes are not at all the thing, young men and women driving about the country in open carriages. Now and then it's all very well, but going to inns and public places together, it is not right. I wonder Mrs Thorpe should allow it. I'm glad you do not think of going. I'm sure Mrs Morland would not be pleased. Mrs Allen, are you not of my way of thinking? 
Do you not think of these kinds of projects objectionable? Yes, very much so indeed. Open carriages are nasty things. A clean gown is not five minutes wear in them. You are splashed getting in and out, and the wind takes your hair and your bonnet in every direction. I hate an open carriage myself. I know you do, but that is not the question. Do you not think it has an odd appearance if young ladies are frequently driven about in them by young men to whom they are not even related? Yes, my dear, a very odd appearance indeed. I cannot bear to see it. Dear madam, cried Catherine, then why did you not tell me so before? I'm sure if I'd known it to be improper, I would not have gone with Mr Thorpe at all. But I always hoped you would tell me if you thought I was doing wrong. And so I should, my dear, you may depend on it. For as I told Mrs Morland at parting, I would always do the best for you in my power. But one must not be over particular. Young people will be young people, as your good mother says herself. You know I wanted you when we first came not to buy that sprig muslin, but you would. Young people do not like to be always thwarted. But this was something of real consequence, and I do not think you would have found me hard to persuade. As far as it has gone hitherto, there's no harm done, said Mr. Allen, and I would only advise you, my dear, not to go out with Mr. Thorpe any more. That is just what I was going to say, added his wife. Catherine, relieved for herself, felt uneasy for Isabella, and after a moment's thought asked Mr. Allen whether it would not be proper and kind in her to write to Miss Thorpe and explain the indecorum of which she must be as insensible as herself, for she considered that Isabella might otherwise perhaps be going to Clifton the next day, in spite of what had passed. Mr. Allen, however, discouraged her from doing any such thing. "'You'd better leave her alone, my dear. She's old enough to know what she's about, and if not, has a mother to advise her. Mrs. Thorpe is too indulgent, beyond a doubt. But, however, you'd better not interfere. She and your brother choose to go, and you will be only getting ill-will.' Catherine submitted, and though sorry to think that Isabella should be doing wrong, felt greatly relieved by Mr. Allen's approbation of her own conduct, and truly rejoiced to have been preserved by his advice from the danger of falling into such an error herself. Her escape from being one of the party to Clifton was now an escape indeed, for what would the Tilneys have thought of her if she had broken her promise to them in order to do what was wrong in itself? If she had been guilty of one breach of propriety only to enable her to be guilty of another. Alrighty then, our our little heroine, Catherine, who is, and we continue to have Jane Austen point this out to us, and she will continue to do this through pretty much all of the book. Catherine is not behaving the way a normal <laughs> heroine would behave. And thank goodness, I like her all the more for it. Let's go back to the beginning of chapter 12, though. Mrs. Allen makes a point about wearing white muslin. And we've talked about white dresses being really a, a status symbol, a, a sign of wealth in other eras before. Uh, something interesting was pointed out in one of the annotations in today's chapter, and that is that we see all of the neoclassical influences on the the costumes, the, the dresses, the fashion of the day, we can see how they're, they're trying to look like, like they're sculpted in marble. And marble, of course, being white, the dresses were white. They didn't know at the time that everything in at least Rome had been painted and probably pretty garishly. And a lot of the statues that are nudes that we go see, you know, they're in there all together, actually probably had clothing placed on them, different colored clothing placed on them when they were, you know, in use in daily life in Rome. That said, they didn't know that. So everything kind of veers towards the white. White is the uh, best color. This was also made possible because of muslin. Muslin was a lot easier to A, make white, and B, keep white. It was easier to wash muslin than it was to wash silk. This is not a surprise. I mean, it's still a to-do, and any of us who have watched, you know, 1800 House, Manor House, all of that stuff, we know how hard the washing was and how hard it was on your hands with the, the lye soap and all of that, not to mention just water. It's still a status symbol, no matter what. There's just more white around than 
there is in, in any other period up until the modern era where we can wash our whites pretty easily. So it's, it's still a status symbol. It's still a sign of wealth. But there are more, more white dresses out and, out and about and available to people who aren't extraordinarily wealthy. Here's another thing. Isabella disses the theater in Bath. Well, that was kind of dumb. Because much like the Croton on Hudson Opera House that I know I mentioned back almost 15 years ago, and the Bucks County Theater Playhouse, which is here where we are living now. It's interesting that we seem to go theater town to theater town in the long run. Bucks County Theater, Croton Opera House, both had the great good fortune of being close enough to New York City to attract Broadway actors and directors. So we still do get Broadway stars showing up in theater here at Bucks County. We also get directors from New York City, from Broadway, down here as well. Bath Theater was no different. And because it was such a popular tourist town the entire year round, whereas London really had its seasons and therefore it had a theatrical season as well, the theater in Bath went year round, giving the London actors, actresses, and directors a place to go and keep working during the off-season. As a consequence, Bath Theater was really quite good. And Isabel is just being a snotty snob. So there's that. There's also, if you wondered why the Tilneys showed up when they did, it's because the theater, kind of like a music hall, would have a scene and then a song and then a ballet and then another song and then another scene. Those were much shorter pieces. This is a five-act play, which is normal. It would be followed by another play in repertory with, um, like in rotation with each other. So they, they didn't just come for Act 5 and waste a bunch of money. They came at the end of Act 5 because they wanted to see the next show. So there's an interval in between the shows, not just in between the acts. When Catherine says, oh, but I didn't, I didn't wish you anything. If I had been able to, though, I would have jumped out of the carriage and run after you. Well, no, young lady should confess to wanting to have or wishing that she had been able to do something like that. That is quite a statement from young Catherine. It does do a, a marvelous job of elucidating for us just how how vigorous she is, having grown up in the country, that she's that she's capable of just thinking that she could leap out of a carriage. It would have been very dangerous had it been moving for her to jump out. It's still a moving vehicle. It may not be a car. It's still going faster than we walk or run. But it's it's a beautiful tribute to her her honesty and her upfrontedness with Henry Tilney, that she's willing to spill the beans on that whole thing. She is not coy. She does not play games. And the longer that these two chapters went on, the more clear the difference has become. I mean, we knew it was there, but the, the clearer the difference, the enormous gulf between uh, Catherine and Isabella is when it comes to things like this. At the end of chapter 12, when Austin is telling us that Thorpe followed Catherine out to her chair, to her sedan chair, and he kept up the delicate flattery, that was a joke. We all know that there is nothing delicate about Thorpe, nor is there anything delicate of his, in his flattery at all. He is a big doof, <laughs> and he wouldn't know delicate if he stepped on it and crushed it, which is the only thing I can imagine him doing. It is interesting in Chapter 13 that the statement is made that it would be questionable to go out as two guys and a girl, even if one guy is the girl's brother. The, the third guy isn't, and that would be questionable. So Isabella's whole, I can't go out without a, a chaperone, so you have to be there too, is kind of edgy. And if you were wondering about this before, you were right to wonder about this before. I didn't want to say anything until we had the talk with Mr. Allen. Really, there needs to be an adult female going along for the ride for this to be kosher, for these two couples to be going out together. Because it's two couples, two carriages. I mean, anything could happen in an open carriage. That would be horrifying. But certainly the thinking of the day was anything could happen if there's no adult there. Although, although honestly, if Mrs. Allen was there, 
she would be doing nothing but paying attention to the girls' dresses anyway. She wouldn't be ta- paying any attention to what the girls inside the dresses were doing. So it w- wouldn't matter much if it was Mrs. Allen. But yes, you were right to pick up on the fact that it is questionable what Catherine has already done. And, and Catherine is now uh, more aware of that as well. And did you not just love Catherine all the more when, after Thorpe's enormous breach of etiquette and just general good-naturedness goes off and lies for her, did you not love her? Well, heck with y'all, then I'm going to go fix this. And she does. She just runs off, beats it out of Dodge, goes to the Tilneys, finds the Tilneys, and <laughs> and mows down the poor doorman. And just runs into the place, opens the door herself, and gets in there. Now, evidently, Thorpe is right that he must have talked to General Tilney. So I guess he wasn't lying about that. And that Tilney likes her because he's not offended by any of this. Of course, he doesn't know that she blew past the doorman. She just knows that she, for one reason or another, opened the door herself, which is also a breach of etiquette. But but he's going to blame his servant not her. She knows better and covers for the servant and makes sure that it's okay. She doesn't want to have any other bad, wrong things happen because of her or on her, on her behalf. But I just loved, like, wow, spine, because she has already been embarrassed by bad behavior once. She's learned from it. She was chagrined. She's chastened. She felt horrible. And now when she's confronted with a similar situation, Blaze Castle be damned, she is going to go make things right. And she does. And I think that's a lovely place to stop for this week. Ah, <sighs> yay. I did manage to get my first vaccination. I got Pfizer. My arm was sore for a good 36 hours. I'm fine now. I had to go to New Jersey to get it. So thank you, New Jersey, because Pennsylvania apparently Wednesday got its butt in gear. Uh, There are certainly some counties in Pennsylvania where people are not getting vaccinated as much as they are elsewhere. And so evidently you can drive two hours in Pennsylvania each way to go get uh, a vaccine uh, not too far from Lancaster County. I decided to drive 45 minutes to Moorestown, New Jersey, to a mega site. I'm not joking. Brilliantly run by the state of New Jersey and the New Jersey National Guard. So loud shout outs to New Jersey. And in particular, the fabulous National Guard's men and women who were running the whole thing. Also, got to tell you, for what has to be a really dredgy kind of job, just sitting in a chair for eight hours a day or more and putting shots in arms, the nurse who I had, the tiny diminutive very sweet-faced nurse who who I sat down next to at the station number eight. <laughs> she was spectacular. She asked me all the questions, very businesslike, got through all that stuff, said, okay, you want it in this arm? Yes. Okay, here. Wiped it down with alcohol. Stabity stabbed me. I didn't feel it go in. I felt the liquid going in because, you know, you do. It's something foreign being injected into the middle of your muscle. You're going to kind of feel the pressure, but it didn't sting. It didn't hurt. I've had flu shots that were much harder to live through than this. Boom. They have you walk to the observation area. They are using the MyChart app, which is genius because as soon as I sat down in my chair, my phone pinged and I looked down and it was the MyChart app saying, hey, you got your first vaccination. Make your appointment now for your second shot. And so you sit there in the chair while you're waiting 15 minutes to make sure your arm doesn't blow up. And on my phone, I made my appointment for my second vaccination. They come by 15 minutes later. Everybody's given a little slip of paper with the time on it. So 9.01, I was supposed to be free to go as long as my arm was fine. They were walking around. They had us all arranged by time. So they'd walk around and say, what time is on your your slip, showed him 901. He looked at his watch and he said, have you made your second appointment? I said, yes. And he said, fantastic. You're ready to go. There's the exit. Bada bing, bada boom. 
so amazed and thrilled to be able to say such positive things about our next door neighbor state, New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope Pennsylvania can figure out how to be you when it grows up. All right. You guys take care of yourselves. I hope you are all able to get vaccines soon. Uh, the mRNA vaccines are really genius. If you haven't gone to, to learn how they work, please do. There are videos everywhere. But this messenger RNA stuff is fascinating. You are not, 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 not being injected with virus, dead or alive. So you don't have to worry about that. It's, it's not like other vaccines where they have to take an inactive form of the virus to inoculate you. They don't. So it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's way better than getting COVID and going, to, even if you go through what my dad went through and have 24 hours of COVID-like misery, it is still better than risking long COVID, a never-ending headache, or never getting your sense of taste or smell back, at least not for months and months and months. So there are some people I know who have, they got sick in April last year and they still can't taste or smell. That is not good. So even if you don't get hospitalized, this disease is weird and creepy. Please, please, please wear a mask. I, even when I'm fully vaccinated, I will be wearing my masks. I don't want to accidentally be a carrier, an asymptomatic carrier, and accidentally get somebody sick who hasn't gotten a vaccine yet. I would not be able to live with myself if I did that. So take care of yourselves, wear a mask, get a vaccine as soon as it is possible for you to do so. Be well. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>